Welcome to this webinar. My name is Firul Bustaksuri. And I am Aida Mulic. In this webinar, our main focus will be directed to the clinical aspects of the initial and moderate carious lesions. We will also talk about tools for identifications of the risk indicators and treatment strategies related to such lesions. According to international consensus approved by FTI, the definition of Initial lesions are non-cavitated carious lesions limited to visual change in enamel color and texture. In the literature, the lesions are often known as subsurface lesions because of the histological manifestations where the alpha layer of the enamel is intact with the visible demineralization underneath. Another term used for initial lesions are white spot lesions because of the characteristic whiteness caused by the changed reflection of light on and under the surface due to change of the direction of crystals and increased porosity underneath the intact enamel surface. Moderate carious lesions, also called grade 3, are limited to the outer third of dentin and are microcavitated lesions. These lesions are characterized by an intact enamel surface with microscopic destruction and demineralization only. This figure shows a moderate carious lesion with presumably intact enamel, where there are no or at least only a few bacteria under the surface. The lesion visible on the X-ray shows radiolucency in the outer third of the dentin, where only demineralization is found, no bacteria. The sclerotized translucent zone, TZ at the picture, is already present at this stage. It follows dentin tubules towards the pulp. Extension is limited by the direction of the enamel prisms involved in the outer enamel lesion. Already before the lesion reaches the enamel dentin junction, the pulp reacts with odontoblastic activity, forming tertiary reactive dentin. Enamel lesions grade 1 and 2, as seen for example on tooth 1-7 and 4-5 distally, are shaped as tri triangular translucent areas with the base towards the surface pointing inwards. On tooth 4-6 distally, a typical moderate grade 3 is shown. Clinical diagnosis of the activity of the carious lesion should take into account the location of the lesion the surface appearance and careful tactile assessment, as well as gingival health. All initial and moderate carious lesions may clinically be categorized as either active or inactive. Definition of an active lesion is a carious lesion exhibiting net mineral loss over a period of time, indicating that the lesion is progressing. Clinically, the lesion may be white or light brown, and have a matte or rough surface. The lesion is usually covered by a plaque. The definition of an inactive lesion is a carious lesion exhibiting no net mineral loss over a period of time, indicating that the lesion is not progressing. Clinically, the lesion may be dark brown or white with a shiny and smooth surface. Usually, there is no visible plaque on the lesion. As an example, this lesion may be inactive for the rest of the patient's life if adequate preventive strategies are implemented. When we are talking about clinical aspects of initial carious lesions, it is important to perform an individual risk assessment. Risk assessment is about future. All data we have about the patient are of the past. It's, is it possible to foretell the future the risk of getting carriers from the past. To help assessing the risk of getting new carriers, we usually consider these seven factors. Carriers experience and carriers activity, saliva properties, composition of diet, oral hygiene, use of fluorides, and social and economical situation. These are risk factors that have to be considered thoroughly to make good decisions and an individual treatment plan. So, Rude, could you explain uh, how these factors are interacting in some sense? You can use a diagram like this. The x-axis shows time, the y-axis shows acidity, the pH. 
When a person eats a meal containing sugar, it's also called carbohydrates, the bacteria on the teeth immediately produces acid and the acidity goes up, meaning pH goes down, as shown in the picture. If the plaque, also called biofilm, is three days or more, enough acid is produced to lower pH to under 5.5, most certainly over 4.5. Hydroxyl will leave the enamel at pH under 5.5, indicated by demineralization of hydroxyapatite. However, at pH higher than 4.5, the fluoride ions, if present, will immediately replace hydroxyl and there will be no mineral loss. Younger plaque or biofilm does not have maturity to produce enough acid. Older plaque will be able to produce acid to lower pH to under 4.5, resulting in loss of minerals of all kind. Saliva helps cleansing the mouth and dilute the acids. As dental health professionals, we are working to accomplish the carious balance. Carious lesion will develop and progress if we have carious promoting factors present, such as cariogenic bacteria, intake of carbohydrates, and reduced salivary production and function. Fortunately, on the other hand, the carious balance may be shifted from demineralization to remineralization if the carious promoting factors are minimized and protecting factors are introduced. The most important protective factor is cleaning so that the biofilm is disturbed. Presence of saliva, calcium, phosphate and certain antibacterial substances are also important to prevent and arrest dental caries. In addition, it's well known and documented that caries decline during the recent decades is mainly based on the use of fluoride in different forms. It is very important to recognize that initial and moderate carious lesions do not normally require tissue removal and should be treated non-operatively. To apply adequate treatment and follow-up, it's important to know how fast carious lesion progresses. In a study by Mayard using annual bite-wing radiographs, the incidence and progression of approximal carries were assessed. It was assessed longitudinally in teenagers and adolescents whose treatment had been based on remineralization rather than restorative strategies. A cohort of 536 children initially was followed from 11 to 22 years of age. Of the sound surfaces, 25% progressed to grade 2 or more after 6 years. And when a lesion was grade 2, that is into enamel, only 25% reached the middle third of the dentin, that is grade four, after five years. 75% of lesions at the enamel dentin border, meaning grade three, progressed into grade four in 1.3 years. Another interesting finding from Meyare and co-workers is the progression of carious lesions on different surfaces. The mesial surface of the mandibular second molar and the distal surface of the maxillary second premolar constitute surfaces of highest risk for carious progression in the dentin, since these surfaces show the lowest median survival times for carious grade 3. Thank you, Aida. Explain a little further why fluorides are so important in preventing and arresting carious lesions. It is well known and documented that carious decline during recent decades and progression of existing carious lesions is mainly caused by the use of fluoride in different form. Fluorides are the most important tool to prevent and arrest initial carious. The carious prophylactic and arresting effect of the locally applied fluoride treatment has been emphasized and is dependent on the following factors concentration of the fluoride agent, higher concentration, better effect, application time, longer application time gives a higher effect, frequency of the fluoride treatment, more often the better, 
pH of the fluoride agent, more acidic fluoride agents, meaning lower pH, the more effective antiochorganic effect is reported. And finally, presence of metal fluorides, such as stannous fluorides and silver diamine fluoride, have been proven effective in both caries prevention and arrest. However, on the Nordic market, there are only a few products containing such agents. The use of topical fluorides is well documented to arrest dental caries, and they may be either self or professionally applied. Tell me a little bit more about toothpaste. Well, fluoride toothpaste is of primary importance and forms the foundation of carious prophylaxis. In combination with distributing biofilm and removal of unfavorable diet, daily toothbrushing with fluoride containing toothpaste is a perfect combination to carious prevention and arrest and is sufficient for most people. However, some patients must be recommended supplementary use of fluoride agents. For example, toothpastes with the high concentrations of fluoride, such as the Rafat toothpaste, which is highly recommended to patients at carious risk, such as patients with hyposalivation, high carious activity, and elderly with exposed root surfaces. In addition, fluoride mouth rinse is recommended to rinse with 0.2% solution for one to two minutes and intended for subjects from six years of age. Some authorities in the field recommend other fluoride products. A few words about that. The recommendation nowadays is that the fluoride tablets should only be prescribed to patients with a high carious risk and used as a supplement to toothpastes. Applying high concentrated fluoride varnish and gel at least two times per year is strongly recommended as carious reduction is reported to be high. The varnish and gel are recommended only to moderate and high-risk populations. You uh, mentioned the silver diamine fluoride. What is it? Well, silver diamine, diamine fluoride, or STF, is another topical professionally applied agent uh, which has a growing interest and contains 44,800 ppm. STF applied to soft dentin and enamel can arrest and remineralize caries. Caries prevention on root surfaces and in primary dentition has been reported to be about 70%. However, it is also worthy to mention that evaluation of the further treatment for all fluoride agents will depend on the effect on individuals' caries risk. But I know. When you have a patient with brown spots like this, do you have any suggestions how to treat it? Well, resin infiltration is a micro-invasive restorative treatment which may be suited for covering those white spot lesions on buccal surfaces, primary front seat, which uh, due to aesthetical reasons, as shown on these pictures. White spot lesions are initial enamel lesions caused by dental caries and are often seen in connection to the post auto treatment. This slide illustrates a 25-year-old male with multiple white spot lesions buckle on his front teeth, which he really dislikes. Those lesions were treated with the resin infiltration during one visit without use of bar. Pre-treatment was only pumice and hydrochloric acid H. The benefits of this kind of treatment is that it's much less invasive than the alternatives like fillings or veneers, and is considered a long-term treatment solution. As shown in these pictures, in this patient, the treatment was stable even four years later. However, this treatment may be debated. It is considered a micro-invasive treatment, but pre-treatment with acid removes the outer remineralized layer of enamel. Disappearance of those lesions cannot be guaranteed, but it may provide a significant cosmetic improvement. Well, now you have explained about infiltration, but when it comes to the indications for treatment of initial and moderate caries lesions, it is always important to adjust strategies to an individual risk profile. All lesions should be monitored and have regular recall. As mentioned, most often initial to moderate active or inactive caries lesions do not require tissue removal. 
It is also in agreement that moderate to severe inactive carious lesions do not require tissue removal when the cavitated lesions in enamel have no contact with the neighbor tooth or restoration. Other examples of when, when moderate lesions, grade 3, may not be treated with operative measures are no cavity present, the tooth has been erupted for a long time, good oral hygiene, adequate diet, and good cooperation and follow-up. However, under certain circumstances, moderate active carious lesions may require minimally invasive tissue removal. That's when there's a cavity present, the tooth has been erupted for a short time, there is high carious activity, non-adequate oral hygiene and diet, and last but not least, no willingness to use fluoride except in fluoride-containing toothpaste.